Hello everybody, uh, welcome to our video lecture. Today's video lecture is going to be about multi-threading and parallel programming. Today we're going to look at, uh, we're going to get an overview of multi-threading. And then we're going to write a task class by implementing the runnable interface and also by extending the thread class. And uh, these two approaches we're going to be analyzing by writing this uh, small program where we like can click on our pane and then click and all the balls start moving and uh, this is an example of multi-threaded program where each ball is uh, in their own thread running in their own thread like six balls in six threads also uh, lastly, we're going to be looking very briefly look at the Java's fork join framework in order to write uh, parallel parallelized uh, programs which run faster. And we're going to be analyzing the uh, prime number testing by using the non-parallelized approach and uh, by using the parallelized approach and look at the differences between those two. All right, let's get started. Right. Let's look at uh, like multi-threading. Uh, let's get an overview of multi-threading very quickly. Okay. Let's assume that this this is our these are our these are the statements of our program. Right. So assume that this is the first statement. We're going from right to left. Okay. And we have lots of statements. You can assume that one line is one statement. And this is one thread of execution. Uh, generally, this is what's, what happens. We start from the beginning of our program and go until the end, and our program stops. And if in the meantime we have a loop, for example, let's say the, that these are the loops, loop instructions, uh, this part of the code is not gonna is gonna wait until this loop finishes. And if 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 it's an infinite loop, this part is never gonna run. Or if it's an infinite loop with a condition, this part is never going to run until this condition becomes false. And when we have one thread of execution, it means we can have only uh, one thing running, right, from uh, from uh, from the beginning until the end. But we can parallelize this set of instructions. So how do we parallelize? Let's say uh, we're going to have this is this is going to be our one thread of execution i'm just going to put a gap here uh, but assume that there is no gap all the instructions go from right to left in in the same order and let's say that this is our uh, we want to do this thing in parallel and also we're going to have some gaps here so what if we like combine both of these instructions it it's it, it's gonna happen like uh, like all of them are gonna be like continuous just like above so if uh, this is an infinite loop it never blocks the running of the green part right so green part this part of the uh, of the code is actually after it's it comes after this part of code but this part this while loop this while loop uh, doesn't block this execution and uh, this, the green part is not dependent on the blue part we can say and this way we can write even two infinite loops in the blue part and also in the green part both of them running at the same time so by using the multi-threading we can divide our set of instructions in our program into multiple threads and do many many things at the same time uh, one of the benefits of using multi-threading uh, is very uh, is very vivid in in GUI applications. Why? Because it, when you have a graphical user interface program, you want your program to be responsive, like you want your buttons to be clickable, and you want your uh, I don't know uh, you want your UI to be responsive. You don't want like when you click on this red button, 
you don't want to wait for like one second even one second you don't want to wait you want it to be uh, happening right away it means there should be some kind of a loop which listens to all these buttons and reacts to user uh, interaction it means there there's something like a and like an infinite loop which listens to all these buttons but also you want to do some action let's say your program uh, wants uh, like on the background it's it's doing some heavy work let's say uh, it's loading some files or it's uh, sending some data through the network and if you have an infinite loop which is running to be responsible uh, to make your GUI responsible you will not be able to do like this networking thing or opening filing files thing this way you will not be able to you'll need to choose one of them right so when you send the files through the network this this time your UI is gonna be not responsive if your UI is responsive this time you you will not be able to say uh, send the files or read the files at the same time so this this is a very vivid example of using in, uh, multi-threading one of your threads is going to be responsible for the GUI and one of the threads is going to be responsible for some background works so if you have very lots of background work I mean things to do uh, like reading from files and saving I mean sending some data through the new network doing some other calculation for each of the tasks you can create one thread and they all all of them are going to be running in parallel All right, so you can. Uh, we're gonna. We're also gonna get some overview of how we can implement uh, this idea in in reality. So there is an interface called Runnable, um, uh, which has one abstract method called Run, which can which should contain the the, the instructions that the thread is going to execute. So if you think that these green lines of code is the thing that this green thread should execute you should put these green instructions into the uh, run method of one thread and uh, the blue instructions in, into another thread alright so you're gonna have two different tasks and both of them are should be written in the run method this is the first way to do it so your task class is going to implement the runnable interface and you need to provide the implementation for run method and inside the run method you put the things that need to be executed by this task class the other way to do is to create uh, a thread class so you will just uh, extend the thread class and then just overwrite the run method of this thread class and this is the second way to do it well what's the difference the difference comes in the usage part when we implement the runnable method uh, I mean when we implement the runnable interface this time we need to create a thread object and then put our uh, runnable instance into that thread and then start this thread we need to call the start thread in order to start the execution of this thread but when we subclass the thread class we don't have to do that since we are already a thread class we can just create an object of our thread class custom thread class and then just start it these are two different approaches and I think it's gonna be clear after we write this small program where we have multiple balls alright let's go ahead and write this multiple balls program Alright, so this is the multiple, I mean, flying balls program, let's call it flying balls. Uh, it opens just uh, an empty window and then, uh, it, well, it has some background color, it's not so important. And then the, the, the window reacts to mouse click. Uh, to be specific, it reacts to the left mouse click, the primary button of the mouse. So each time I click, we click on a button it just displays a circle uh, where the stroke width is one pixel and the radius is some random number uh, we're gonna specify that uh, the range of this random uh, the range of the radius is some random color and we can add many many circles 
as many circles as, as, as we want. And then when we click the right button of the mouse, they all start moving in, 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 uh, in random direction, but it's actually not random. Uh, where you click with your right mouse button, they start to move to that location. So here, I can no longer press the right left button or right button. When the process is started, I can't change it, but all of these balls just move indefinitely. They never stop. So this is the program that we're going to be uh, doing. Uh, these here we have five balls. Uh, all, each of the balls is in a separate uh, thread, and also we have the UI, which is also in a separate thread. The Java FX UI is in a separate thread. And uh, yeah, let's begin by writing our code. All right, so we have a class called Flying Balls. This uh, we're going to write everything from scratch. Our, we're going to call our class, uh, our program, Flying Balls. This Flying Balls is going to extend the application class of the JavaFX application class, and we need to implement the abstract start method. We're going to define some uh, constants. Uh, the first content, constant is height, public, static, final, double, height. Now let's just say that it's 600 pixels. And also, one more constant is going to be width. Uh, it's going to be 800 pixels. Uh, these two constants should be uh, fine for, uh, uh, for this moment. We're going to add more constants later. Let's include the method public void init handlers, I mean init layout, sorry. We're going to in initialize the layout here. And we're going to be moving our balls on a pane. So we should, we're going to have private pane, uh, let's import it, uh, root pane. So inside the init layout, we're going to say that our root pane is a new pane. And we're going to uh, put a background color to our root pane, set style. And by using the JavaFX CSS background color, we're just going to specify that it's light green. After that, we're going to say root pane dot set preferred size. First is width, and the next is height. All right, so this is going to be our pane. Uh, we need to call this method, and then after that, we're going to say primary stage dot set scene. New scene. We actually don't need the reference to a scene. That's why we can do. Uh, we can just create it as an anonymous object. And we're going to put our root pane into this scene. And then we're going to show our, uh, our stage. Let's just do primary stage, set always on top, true. So our window is always on top. So let's just run this program. We need to see our application uh, running uh, with a light green background. All right, so this is it. Currently, it doesn't react to any of the mouse clicks. It's just an empty window. Let's just close it. Now we're going to be implementing the handlers. Public void init handlers. Inside the init handlers, we're going to write code, which is going to be responsible for reacting to mouse clicks. So we need to say root pane dot set on mouse clicked. We're going to be using the lambda expression. So inside this uh, set and mouse click, we're going to uh, write code which is which is going to run each time we uh, each time we click on a mouse on on this pane. First of all, we're going to get the location of the click, the x location and the y location. And then we're uh, depending on which of the buttons is clicked we're going to be doing some certain things let's we need to like recognize the left click and right click of the mouse we're going to say if uh, e dot get button equals mouse button dot primary it means it's the left button we could just system print the land one all right 
or left. Else if uh, e.getButton equals mouse button but secondary, it means it's the right button. We need to call this method from the start method init handlers. And that's it. So let's just run it. Now we should be able to, our program should be able to react to mouse clicks. Left click, right click, left click, right click. You can see the output right here. All right, so this is not very uh, interesting. We want to add some, we want to add some balls, right? So we want to add some circles. Yes. So circles are, uh, we're gonna say that the circles are gonna be like a class ball and this ball is gonna be runnable right so it's gonna be able to move itself in a separate thread that's what we're gonna do we're gonna write a uh, we're gonna write a class ball it's gonna extend the circle and it's gonna implement the the runnable interface so since runnable interface has one abstract method we need to implement it right public wide run method but uh, at this point, we don't have any, 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 anything inside the run method. We need just, we want just, we would, ju we just want to show a circle on the pane. So what, what do we do? Well, <coughs> uh, we need a constructor for this class, public ball, and we need the location, right? So we're gonna say double x, double y because we want to create a circle at that location. We're gonna call set fill. Since we're extending the circle class, we call this we can call the circles methods directly. Set fill and color that color and some random color. Method random method random method random. Also we need to set stroke width to one pixel and set stroke to color black sorry black we want it to be black color and then we want the radius set radius let's just say 10 okay at this point all of them are going to be uh, the same radius and then we're going to say set uh, center x is going to be x create some balls when we do a left click we're not going to do uh, like system out print align we're just going to do each time there is a left click we're going to say ball ball equals new ball at x and y since this ball is a circle because it extends a circle we can just say root pane dot get children add ball so this should add our ball into the pane let's just go ahead and try our code all right now we can add as many circles as we want at some specified locations but like uh, we can do a right click we can still see the right click and then we can still add the circles but after we do right click we shouldn't be able to add circles because the process should start when we do the right click that's why we're going to say that our uh, flying balls is going to have uh, it's going to have a private boolean started which is going to be false at the beginning right it's not started and if it's not started and it's primary button we're going to add button if it's not started and it's the right button we're going to do the thing and then we're going to say started equals false uh, started equals true and then we're no longer going to be able to process the, the mouse clicks. Let's run again. I can add the circles and then right click. And then I can no longer add circles or do any right click because this variable prevents us from, from doing that. All right. Now what happens next? Well, after we do the right click, uh, our balls should start moving. And this is when we are gonna like this is the main logic and uh, there's lots lots of things that should happen so first of all uh, first of all there is a thing called uh, frame rate this is uh, how many times per second our uh, 
balls are going to recalculate their position. This is called frame rate. We're going to just specify it as a, as a constant public stack. Uh, final double frame rate. We're going to say that it's 60. It's going to refresh the window 60 times per second. Okay, we can change it. And we want our balls to have some speed. All right, so we're going to say public static final double speed. Let's say it's going to be 400 pixels per second. Okay, this is going to be uh, pixels per second. This is going to be refreshes per second. And then we want also uh, some uh, minimum radius and maximum radius, public static final double mean uh, radius. Let's just say it's 10 pixels and let's say that the max radius is 20 pixels. Okay, we're not going to use this mean and max radius. At this point, let's just say that our, all of our circles are uh, 10 pixels in radius, the same size. Okay, so we have our frame rate and speed. What are we going to do next? So the logic is going to happen in here. So uh, since uh, the, like the balls can, ha can move in different directions, we need to specify this direction. Let me just open this part. So let's say this is our ball. Okay, it has some vector of velocity. Okay, the magnitude of this vector, the length, is going to be the speed, which is 400 pixels as we specified it. And also we have like the angle and I, I don't know all of these things. And like the, the vector itself is just a point, right? Uh, a two-dimensional point and uh, we need to have it inside the the ball class we're gonna say private uh, point to D from the job effects geometry and we're gonna say that this is velocity is gonna be new uh, point to D and we can just specify some uh, initial 100 by 100. This time it means that the point is going to, I mean, the ball is going to move 100 by 100, which is down below, right? By x it's going to be 100, and by y it's going to be 100, and the length of this is going to be around 141, right? Its, it's speed is going to be 141 pixels per second, all right? Okay, this is the default speed. We also should have a method to, ch to be able to change the velocity, uh, like the direction and speed. We're going to say public void set velocity. It's going to accept the point to the instance. Now some point. And we're going to say that the velocity equals point. So what do we do after that? So inside the run method, uh, we're going to have some infinite loop because our balls are going to are not never going to stop and they're going to move uh, until forever, right? They're always going to move. Uh, we're going to do some updating behavior, updating method. We're going to update like update method is going to be doing is going to be calculating the next position for the ball in each frame after each frame and it's going to wait for some cert, uh, specified amount of time and then update again all right so we need to do thread.sleep here we need to specify the milliseconds so uh, since we specified that our refresh rate is going to be frame rate like 60 times per second it means our update should happen every 1000 over flying balls that frame rate it should happen this many times. So if your frame, if our frame rate is 50 milliseconds, it should wait for 20 milliseconds, and in one second it's going to do 50 times, 50 times the update. And we need to this uh, sleep method calls the I mean, throws the uh, interrupted exception. That's why we need to uh, we need.
need to put it into a try catch block before putting the try catch block this should be a long variable that's why we're gonna cast it into long sorry for that Oops. let's do like this and then we need to do it into a try catch all right now we're gonna write the method uh, update okay public wait update again update is going to calculate the next position for the ball check it if it's a correct position and then reposition the ball all right so how do we do the checking well uh, first of all we need to find by how by what amount our ball should move forward okay by what how by how many pixels it should move forward well we know the direction we know the direction let's say let's say this is our ball and this is the direction it's like uh, 100 pixels let's say this is 100 and this is 100 as well 100 pixels by X and 100 pixels by Y it should move this I mean it should move 100 pixels in one second and 100 pixels in one second in this direction but since uh, uh, we're doing this in one second, right? And our ball refreshes 60 times per second. We need to move uh, like uh, 100 divided by 60 to the right and 100 divided by 60 down, right? So we need to divide it by, uh, by the, the, the frame rate. So we can assume that our period, the amount of time in each frame is going to be 1 over flying balls that frame rate okay, this is the amount of time in each frame and by how many pixels does it move in this amount of time it's gonna be double this is uh, dx is gonna be uh, <clears throat> velocity that get x right because this is the amount of the pixels by x direction multiplied by period and this is the amount of pixels that we move in x direction and this is the amount of pixels we move in in y direction okay after that we check uh, whether by moving by this amount of pixels is right I mean we can do that or not okay in what situations we can move and in what situations we can't when our ball is moving like the top and it's like reaching this position like touching the top part we need to change the vector downwards right so the y coordinate of the vector should flip the sign if it's like minus 100 now it should be 100 and then it's should flip down but x coordinate doesn't change the same should happen when we reach the bottom right if we're moving down and then we start moving up the y uh, coordinate i mean the y part of the velocity changes flips its sign in what case do we fl flip the sign let's say our ball is located here and when we add the dx and dy if we when when we add the dx and dy if our ball like moves out of the screen it means uh, we need to flip the flip the sign right so we need to detect this how do we detect we say if 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 the center of this ball plus dy right plus dy the center plus by how many amounts uh, by, by what amount we move uh, uh, I mean, by y direction if this is less than the get radius it means we are we're already at this position right so the dx, let's say, oh, sorry, dy, let's say that this is dy, this height, plus the radius, which is this. If it is, plus, oh, sorry, if, uh, if the get center x, yeah, this plus d, dy, if it's less than the radius, it means the ball is already, I mean, it's moving 
it's crossed the upper boundary. Uh, it's crossed the upper boundary. Or how to check the bottom part. So ball is here, right? If uh, like the the center of the the y part of the center plus d y dy, sorry dy uh, plus the radius plus the radius is bigger than the height of the screen. We say get center y plus dy plus get the radius is bigger than the height of the screen which is uh, flying it's it's a constant right height in this case we means we hit the bottom part well what do we do in this case we just need to change the sign of the velocity we'll just say velocity equals new point to d velocity dot get x now change and minus velocity dot get y we need to flip the sign of the y coordinate and we do the same thing with uh, for the uh, x coordinates. If well, how do we che check if it's the right part? This is the case when we need to flip, right? If the x coordinate of the center plus the radius is if uh, get center x plus dx, we already moved it plus the center, I mean plus uh, the radius, is bigger than uh, the width. It means we hit, I mean we're f f falling out of the right part, or uh, now the left part, if uh, the x coordinate plus dx is less than the radius get center x plus dx is less than the radius it means sorry get radius it means we hit the, the left part okay so this is up up down up or down and this is right or left and in this case we need to flip the sign of the x coordinate I'm just gonna copy this code here and the y coordinate is gonna stay the same and the x coordinate is gonna flip like this and after that what do we do we need to uh, change the change the velocity right I mean uh, we need to relocate the uh, the center coordinate of the circle we're just gonna say set center X which is gonna be uh, get center X sorry get center X plus DX we're gonna move it, set center y, we're gonna say get center y plus dy. This is what we're gonna do and this is gonna happen all the time. Alright, now how do we call this method from here? Uh, let's say all of them are gonna have like the default velocity at the beginning. We do the left click. After we do the left click, what, what's gonna happen? Since this ball implements the runnable interface, we need to do we need to create a thread class, thread thread equals new thread, and we put this ball into that thread, and then we do thread dot start. That's what can happen. And when we do the right click, ah uh, oh, sorry, sorry sorry sorry, we need to do this when we do the right click. Okay, and we need to have a reference to the balls. We need to have all the balls, right? That's why we're going to create an array list here. Private array list, array list of balls. Balls equals new array list. And down below, we're going to say balls that add ball. And here we're going to say we're going to have a while loop. I mean for loop for each ball ball in balls what do we do we say this one okay we'll put each ball into a thread and then start the thread okay let's let's see what's, what's gonna happen left click right click and we can see that our ball is moving 100 pixels 
and it can deflect from the sides of our window which is nice okay now let's add more balls we're gonna start again and add many many balls yeah our balls are moving but you know uh, this ball froze and these balls are moving like very uh, like flickering right I can see it from here I don't know if you can see it from the video but they're flickering very heavily and it's just three balls and they are disappearing you see they are disappearing why is it happening well it's happening because we are running these uh, each of the while loops are running uh, on separate thread but they are changing the UI uh, and this interferes with the UI's thread that's why when we have a multi-threaded application and the result of this multi-threaded I mean the result of these threads if we want them to change the UI it's better to use this platform platform run later because we're changing the UI we're gonna say new runnable and then put the code which changes the UI into this run method okay now let's ch just see the, the difference one two three four five run all of them and all of them are running smooth smoothly and very beautifully but they're kind of like uh, slow we're gonna make them a little bit faster we need to change the speed which is around uh, we, we we change the speed here right 300 by 300 they're gonna be three times faster and also since this uh, is an anonymous class we can write it as a lambda expression we can just say platform dot run later and this runnable doesn't have any arguments that's why it's gonna be empty and then the arrow sign okay we don't write e as uh, in the case of the handler yeah because the mouse set on mouse click accepts the mouse event that's why we write e but here we don't have any argument that's why sh we should leave it as empty and inside this lambda expressions code we just put this uh, two instructions this way it's kind of much more uh, elegant and smaller now our balls are gonna be faster and you can see all of the balls are moving in these directions but this is like boring directions yeah now let's change the direction so that all of them start moving in in, in the direction where I click the mouse where I click the mouse so before starting where do where do we start the balls before starting we need to assign the direction for, to each ball right the direction to each ball so how do we assign the direction let's say that our ball is located right here we have like two balls located in two different places and our we are clicking our mouse here it means this ball should start moving here by the specified speed which is 400 and this ball should start moving here by by 400 pixels per second and how does it happen well we know that if we have like two points yeah like a and b the vector a b equals like the coordinates of b minus the coordinates of a all right and uh, this is going to be the vector AB. Now we need to make this vector AB of length 400, right? Because the the length of this vector is going to be the speed of our uh, ball, right? So how do we convert it into 400 pixels? Well, we first normalize it. We make it uh, of uh, length 1 and then multiply it by, by 400, right? So we need to find this direction here. We're going to say point to D direction equals new point to D, uh, which is going to be X and Y, where we click the mouse. And then what do we do? We need to subtract from it a, new, uh, a point of the ball's X, uh, center X and center Y. Right? We're going to write it here. Subtract ball.getCenterX, ball.getCenterY, 
and then we're going to normalize it and then we're going to multiply it by the speed right? okay this is going to be the direction of of the balls this is these are, this is going to be the direction of the ball and uh, we do ball dot set direction set velocity sorry set velocity direction I'm sorry for many different names for the same kind of thing because we're using here velocity here we're using direction here we're using point I'm sorry for the confusion you can think of the velocity as just the velocity vector and direction is direction vector which is the same as velocity vector and after we set the velocity we can start the thread safely now let's run this to see our result let's just place the balls in one line at the top like this many many balls and then let's right click down below all of the balls are gonna start moving here alright very beautiful they all start bouncing like this and each ball is running in a separate thread which is which is really nice okay now what did we uh, what do we want to do? Well, we have the mean radius and max radius. Let's just keep it for now. I'm trying to remember what we wanted to do. I think we didn't miss anything. Let me double check. All right, we did everything of, uh, from the ball class. Now let's do the mean radius and max radius. Uh, we're going to do it inside the ball class, right? So set radius, not 10, but it's going to be method random multiplied by the range of the numbers the range of the numbers is going to be uh, max radius uh, minus mean radius and uh, we need to shift it like this so now we will be able to add the circles of different of different uh, radii let's run again all right we have different size circles between 10 and 20 and all of them start moving wherever I click the mouse and I no longer can click the mouse at different locations yeah we have some problems at some point like balls are sticking to the edge uh, but that's not a big problem uh, like the main logic is uh, working now let's add bigger balls we're gonna say the, the, the radius of the balls are going to be from uh, 10 until 200 okay let's actually say that the the speed of the ball depends on the radius we're gonna say multiply by speed okay this is the speed of the ball divided by a ball that get radius okay if this, the radius is bigger it's going to be slower if the radius is smaller it's going to be faster okay something like this let's just actually uh, decrease it a little bit ball get radius divided by uh, four let's say all right so we're going to decrease its effect four times let's just run it this is just an experiment you don't have to do that wow huge ball and you can see that this ball is very uh, this faster this is slower but I think this is too slow right we need to decrease the effect dot zero all of them are huge balls wow I think I made too too big Let's make them 1 to 100. Let's run again. Okay, this is much better. All right, now we can see that this ball, this ball is moving a little bit faster, but all other balls are moving slower because they are big. Yeah, you can play around with this and change the parameters as, as you wish. Okay, so we finished our program by implementing the runnable interface. We can tweak this 
frame rate, for example, let's change the height and width. Let's say that the height is 600, but the width is 1,200. Frame rate is uh, 10 frames per second. Speed is fi uh, 500. Let's remove this. Uh, all of them are going to move in the same speed. And the mini radius, minimum radius is going to be 10. The maximum radius is going to be 30. And uh, we're going to see the effect of this frame rate. And you can see that when the frame rate is small, you can see that the balls are not moving smooth, right? So we, we're going to increase it to 60 because 60 is, should be enough. Let's start again. Move to this left down corner. All of them start moving here and then deflect and all of them like move in some random directions. How cool is this? really beautiful all right so we finished it with the with implementing the runnable interface now let's do it with uh, extending the thread class and then uh, like uh, uh, look at the difference between these two approaches public uh, ball thread I'm gonna call this class ball thread because it's gonna extend the, uh, the thread class so what do we need to sorry public class thread, right? So what this class should have? Well first of all, it's no longer a circle because we are not extending the circle. That's why we need to have a circle inside. Private circle ball. Okay, equals let's just say equals new circle. And uh, it's actually is going to be like this, uh, the same, right? So it's also going to have velocity. It's also going to have the constructor, the set velocity, and update and run methods. Like the contents are going to be exactly the same, but we're going to change some of the parts of the code. Velocity is the same. This is the default velocity. Ball, the, we should change it to ball thread. And when we can't call the set field because it's not a circle, but rather we do it as ball that set field, right? After that, uh, the the circle should be able to add itself to the pane, right? That's why we need to have here, like the pane parent. What's the parent pane for the circle? We're gonna do parent dot get children dot add ball, right? We, because we need to add the circle after we draw it initially. Set velocity sets it update uh, get center we should add here ball that get center let me just copy it ball get radius ball get center ball get radius ball get center ball get radius get center get radius ball set center ball set center ball get center ball get center all right and we keep this platform run later because we are changing the UI in the run method it's just called this update method Okay, now how do we add these? Uh, let's use this ball thread in the you know, flying balls uh, program. Well, we're going to have an array list of ball threads. Okay, it's going to be new array list. We're just going to comment these balls. And down below, we're going to say, okay, this code is referring to the ball uh, balls. We're going to say ball thread. Uh, ball equals new ball thread. Here we need to specify the x and y coordinates, x and y, and also the parent, which is root pane, right? Because the ball should be added to root pane, the circle, I mean the circle. And then we do ball threads dot add the ball. Okay? This for loop, we, we're gonna comment it, and we're gonna do uh, like the same thing for each ball thread in ball threads what do we do with this ball first of all we need to find the location actually this part is gonna be the same let me just copy it we found the uh, the direction and here we have like the get center x get center y we need to get the center and uh, center coordinates for this ball which is gonna say public uh, 
circle get ball which is gonna return the sorry I'm not writing it in the correct place it should be down below uh, yeah we should return this uh, ball I think I can generate it control uh, alt insert generate getter for the ball okay get ball return ball and here what do we do we say ball dot get ball dot get center ball dot get ball dot get center actually it's better if we change change its name to ball thread alright and also in this part it should be actually it's logically should be ball thread Then we find new direction, ball thread set velocity, thread. We don't no, we no longer can need to put this ball thread into a thread class, we can just say ball thread dot start. Okay, let's run it and see the result. Click and all of them are running smoothly. Okay, we have the same result. But this time we implemented this using uh, by extending the thread class. And now let's look at differences. Now let's look at the differences. I'm gonna minimize this flying balls class. First of all, the runnable interface. When we implement the runnable, our class can still extend from some other class, right? For example, circle. But when we do it using the extends we can no longer extend from some other class so this is the first difference this is the first difference next uh, since we can extend we have the circle itself right so we don't need to create like the circle like here we don't need to create the circle in uh, in a class where we implement this is the second difference the third difference is well, it actually kind of like logical since we care only about the run method. Sorry, I, since we care only about the run method. Yeah, we care only about the run method. It's sufficient for us to just implement the runnable interface. But when we extend the thread class, we also gain access to all the methods of the thread class. For example, threads have this the method called stop I think it should be stop ball thread dot stop yeah yeah it should uh, what's deprecate it's a deprecated method we have like the method called join we get, we have lots of methods from the thread class we, like all of them should can be checkable from the documentation which we kind of like do not use right so uh, when we like like what's the idea behind choosing which approach to use well most of the time it's gonna be just implementing the runnable interface but when we need access to the methods of the thread class to have more control then we need to uh, like it's better maybe for us to just extend from the thread class or when we need to override the behavior of the methods of the thread class like the join method we need to override it then in this case we have to extend the do we have to i'm not sure uh, we should extend the thread class all right so that this is the difference okay i hope this example clearly showed you how to use this uh how to use the multi-threading in action also we looked at one important thing which is right here yeah when we change the ui the user interface we need to put it uh, into this uh, run later method right the part of code to make our ui responsive because ui is responsible for listening to the user events right all right now let's move to our next uh, section which is about
Alright, now let's talk about the fork join framework uh, of uh, Java. So for, for, uh, the fork join framework is used for parallel programming. Uh, parallel programming is becoming uh, very popular lately. Uh, it just uh, makes use of uh, the ability of uh, makes use of the like the, the multiple processors of computers. So back in the day, there were only single core computers where there's only single CPU. But currently, even like mobile phones have tons of CPU. Like uh, for example, the computer which I'm making a video right now has like eight CPUs eight cores, right? We call them cores. So when you write a program, like a serial program, and it's not uh, parallelized, your program is not is gonna run only on one CPU. All of other seven CPUs are gonna be like doing nothing, okay? It's, just, it's like a human with eight hands, but uh, using only one hand, right? To do some work, uh, which is not efficient. To, uh, your program can be much more efficient if you run it if you run it on using all the cores, right? So, in order to be able to use all the cores of your computer, of your CPU, you should be able to parallelize your program. Parallelize means change it in in such a way so it can run on many uh, on, on many cores at the same time simultaneously. Let me give you an example. So let's say you have an array of million numbers. Okay, let's assume that this is an array of million numbers. Okay, million numbers, and you want to find what's the total of this array. Okay, total of this array. If you run it on a single CPU, then your single CPU is gonna run million addition operations. It's like 10 to the power of six operations. But if you run it on, let's say, uh, six CPUs, well, let's say this is six CPUs, each CPU is going to run how many operations? Sorry, not six. A million, uh, let's say it's eight, CP eight cores. A million divided by eight is going to be 125,000, yeah, 125 thousand which is six times faster than this one okay so how do we parallelize it well which is gonna give the first uh, core of this com uh, of this CPU like the first 185,000 numbers the second CPU we're gonna give the next 125,000 numbers the next CPU is gonna take the next 125,000 numbers each of the CPUs are gonna get different portions of this initial array find the sum and then like uh, return it and then we need to just add these six numbers okay this is like the key idea behind the parallel programming and writing your code such that it uh, your task is divided into uh, different pieces to different cpus like uh, uh, distributed among different cpus is called parallelizing your code so this is like the uh, like the graphical illustration. So you have a problem, you divide it into different sub-problems, and then each sub-problem is run on different CPUs at the same time, and then you join the result to get the solution. This is the idea behind this parallel programming. Java has this uh, fork join framework that does this all division, all of this background technical uh, details uh, are like it's already done and implemented in the Java fork join framework. So we have like the uh, the class called fork join task, uh, which is an abstract class for the tasks that can be done. And the subclasses of this fork join task are a recursive action and recursive task. A recursive action is something is a task uh, which doesn't return any value. Recursive task is something that returns some value. And yeah, I, I need to mention that uh, our program, the problem we want to parallelize, should be uh, should be uh, re redesigned in a recursive fashion. 
right? Like just like the merge sort, for example, the example of merge sort here. How do we uh, do with the merge sort? We divide it into pieces, the array into two pieces, and merge sort the left part, merge sort the right part, and then the join. So the action of the sorting is actually the sorting the left part and then the right part and then the join joining the result. So this is kind of like the recursive call. We need to uh, redesign our problem into the recursive fashion. All right. So this method fork here, it actually uh, it's a method of this uh, recursive task and recursive action. It just uh, it just like calling this sub problem, okay, asynchronously. So we have different subtasks, and we want to call them asynchronously. It's just this fork method, and like the join method is this part when we get the result. So this is an example of the merge sort here uh, on two processors. It's like this many milliseconds on. Sequential time is this many milliseconds, and also there is like parallel max, but I prepared a different, uh, different example, where we we're gonna, where we we're gonna find the number if it's prime or not. All right, so we're gonna look at an example of a number if it's prime or not. Well, how do we do it? Let's say we we have some number n. How do we say if it's prime or not? We need to start from number two. This is like the very simplistic algorithm, and then three, and then blah 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 blah, until square root of n. Okay. We need to check each number if it divides this uh, original n uh, or not. If this n, original n, is divisible by any of these numbers between two and root n, like without any remainder, we can say that this is not prime. Okay, not prime. If none of the numbers divide this original number, we can say safely that this number is prime. So how do we parallelize this uh, program, this task? Uh, we're going to say that we have this original n. We still have these numbers, 2, 3, dot, 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 and until root n. We're going to have a task which um, we're going to divide it into two pieces. The left piece contains the numbers until the middle, and the right piece is going to contain the numbers from the middle until this root n into two pieces. And uh, we're going to test each number in the left part if it divides this n. And we're going to test the numbers on the right part if it divides this n. And we're going to return true or false. Right? If none of the numbers divide, it means it's prime, we return true, let's say true, okay, and none of the numbers from here divide this original n, we return true, and if both of them are true, it means this n is true, because none of the numbers here, none of the numbers here, true, true, it means this is prime, okay, this is going to be our approach. Again, uh, uh, we're dividing into two pieces. In your implementation, you can divide it into four pieces. For example, you can change it so that it divides into four pieces like this. And then you just take uh, the, like the results from each of these four pieces and combine them. And if all of them are true, it means this original n is true. This is how, how we're going to parallelize. All right, let me open the, the code. So here I, we have a method called isPrime. This is a sequential implementation. And we have some long number because we're going to work working with huge numbers, and it's it returns a boolean. We go and uh, we start from two until uh, we go until the square root of number. This i times i less than or equal to number is the same as i is less than or equal to the square root. If the number can be divided by this i, we just return false. Otherwise, we return true. And the precondition, the condition which should be has to be true before running this, uh, before calling this method is num bigger than one, uh, which is starting from two, right? And uh, yeah, uh, we like write code such that this condition. We assume that this condition is true and write our code. We're sure that our number is negative, not not negative, right? So very simple. 
and in this in this part in no parallel part we start measuring our time we call our is prime method and then assign this flag to true mark the end of the time and if it is prime we're just gonna print no parallel no parallelism how many milliseconds the number is prime or not yeah it's gonna be true and we're gonna start from one leading with 15 zeros is one quadrillion this is a very big number uh, just to see the difference uh, like to feel the difference in execution time now let's look at the parallel execution I mean parallel implementation we have co a method called is prime parallel it's gonna run uh, in parallel all right so we, we're gonna we have a recursive task uh, is prime task it returns a boolean you see recursive task returns boolean if it was an action we wouldn't be able to return anything so it returns a boolean we send the number and then send the starting number which is 2 right here yeah. and uh, the square root of number plus 1 converted to long I do plus 1 just to ensure that this square root is included and then we write this fork join pool and then uh, we invoke this is prime task and return the result of this uh, of this uh, of this task the pool is just uh, is just a collection of threads, right? So, but I don't know on the background how many threads it, it just creates. Creating multiple, like 100 threads or 1000 threads, is not efficient. A more efficient way is to just create 10 threads and uh, have 100 tasks than 100 threads and 100 tasks. So, this fork join pool is going to manage all this thread communication, thread thing. All right, so we just put this task into this fork join pool. Now, what is this is prime task? Well, it's a class. In this case, it's just a static class, static inner class, private static inner class, which it extends the recursive task uh, and returns a boolean. So it's going to return true if no number is in low, high, divide the number. Uh, low part is included and high part is not included. Okay, high part is not included. That's why we have the plus one here returns false otherwise well it's not that it's not the class that returns but the method called compute which is an abstract method in this recursive task class okay so when the the range of the numbers is small all right let's say 100 it's not efficient to parallelize this code it's more efficient to just do it in serial because parallelizing comes with some overhead because uh, like, uh, like Java needs to create some threads and allocate some memory which takes some time that's why when our uh, like the, the range is small which is it's better just to do it in serial so the threshold is 1000 so when the difference between this low and high is 1000 is less than 1000 which is going to do it in serial and these are like the data fields the number which is needs which needs to be checked and the lowest number and highest number all right the lowest number is this let's say the, uh, this this number in, and the highest number is this number all right then uh, they specify the range of numbers which need, which need to be checked and in the compute method the logic goes if the high minus low is less than the threshold it means like the the, the numbers we need to check is less than 1000 numbers right uh, yeah we start from low and go until high and uh, we just check it like this we return true if it's if no the numbers if no none of the numbers divide else it means the threshold is bigger in this case we need to find what's the middle part we divide our task into two the left part is going to be new prime task going from low until mid and the right part goes from mid until high okay we fork both of the parts and these parts are gonna execute asynchronously and when both of them finish like the join is gonna wait until left join is gonna wait until the uh, until the left part finishes and right join is gonna wait until the right part finishes and this statement is gonna execute only when the left and right part are finished okay and 
if both of them are true we're going to return true if one of them is false it's going to be false so this is like the both of them should be true in order to get true right because we have end here and that's it this is the explanation of the code now let's look at the uh, the result i'm going to run it and we're going to see uh, in action so we can see that for this number the parallel no parallel took us 382 milliseconds but parallel 65 milliseconds which is five times faster here again it's around five times faster on eight cores here again it's around five times faster and we can see that we made our program five times more efficient by just uh, using the fork join framework of the Java alright so this completes our uh, our uh, lecture on fork join uh, framework in Java alright guys this is the end of the video lecture uh, today we talked about multi-threading and parallel programming we got an overview of multi-threading uh, what multi-threading is in general we uh, wrote a program with uh, multiple circles or balls and, and implemented using the runnable interface and extending the thread class using two approaches and we looked at how we can change the UI using this platform that run later method and last thing that we did is looking uh, at the fork join framework of Java and we looked at how we can make our programs much more efficient by implementing this fork join framework and using parallel programming in our uh, applications. Thank you guys for your attention. Uh, thank you for watching this video until the end. See you guys in the next one. Bye bye.